Here we go. So we are here with Professor Jim Hughes. It's an absolute honor to have you on MLST, Jim. Thank you so much for coming on. It's a pleasure. Amazing. Um, so um, you are a professor of gene regulation at yep. Oxford University. Yep. And um, you said that you study the basic biology of how genes are regulated in the mammalian genome in concert with how sequence variation in the human population affects this and predisposes towards disease. Yep, that's a so, good summary. I think you're reading off my <laughs> website. <laughs> Tell me, I mean, obviously, like we're a, we're a machine learning and AI podcast yeah. and we're at a creativity um, event yeah. and, you know, maybe like talk about what, why are you here today? What are you talking about here today? Um, okay. Maybe just a little bit of history. So yeah. I've been working in the genome for 30 years, pretty much, man yeah. and boy. Yeah. Um, and I started off um, as a bench person, very much working cloning bits of genome, doing all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, at about the time the genome got sequenced, which was about 10 years into that, so it's like 2002 thereabouts, um, <clears throat> we realized that a very small amount of the genome was actually genes. Hmm. And actually it's huge. That's the other problem. And so then I started shifting into a computational side. So yep. I started to learn to code do statistics, you know, write packages, do all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is just kind of the full extension of it now. <laughs> After 20 years, <clears throat> I've got a research group which has got um, JavaScript programmers, machine learning people, uh, people from mathematics backgrounds, people cloning things, doing molecular experiments. Yep. So it's just kind of tracked my life um, yes. that I ended up being a computer um, sort of biologist, sort yes. of, if you want to put it that way. Um, why? Well, I mean, science is very creative. I mean, it is necessarily a creative thing. I mean, people often think of scientists as quite sort of logically minded and, well, yes, we are. I mean, there's a big burden of proof <clears throat> in anything we do, but actually, to actually get to the next step, we have to be creative at the same time. Yes. Often yeah. that will be coming up with new ideas, new hypotheses. But also new methods. So a lot of what I'm <clears throat> known for in my field is developing new molecular methods, things that you do mm -hmm. at the bench. Mm -hmm. But we also develop new computational methods like machine learning models, um, just to try and work out how these things work. Because you know we have three billion base pairs in our genome, and they're working differently in every single cell type in our body. And yeah. we don't know how many cell types is actually in our body. Yes. So the human brain just ran out of steam quite a long time ago. So we need to go to these approaches. What does it mean to be creative? Um, I actually watched a really good talk uh, by Edwin, I'm trying to remember his second name now, about what creative means. Yes. In my view, it's, he said it's all about noise in the brain. Right. And that makes a lot of sense to me. If everything's really stable, you never really shift from one state to another. Yeah. Where I think creativity comes from is letting things collide in your brain, having a slightly messy brain, which sounds a strange things for a scientist to say, but I think that's what it is. I think you have a messy brain. Things just bump into each other a lot. You go, hmm. oh, do they connect? Mm -hmm. Do they not connect? Could I do this? So different things bumping around in your brain in a sort of semi-messy way is probably my own internal logic for creativity. Interesting. So, I mean, going, going back to, like, you know, the, the cognitive scientists in the 80s, uh, like Foda and Polition, thought mm. we had this language of thought. Yeah. And that, you know, we, there's this kind of primacy to logical reasoning, if you like, yep. rather than it being some kind of post hoc rationalization. Mm. I mean, do you think it's a post hoc rationalization? I think it's probably a bit of both to some degree, because, the, you know, we, our own personalities are the model of what we were. I mean, mm. that's how we rationalize ourselves. Yes. And I think any model that we make, whether it's a scientific hypothesis or the world around us or who our friends are, or, you know, all of that kind of stuff is basically us trying to make sense of the stuff that happened behind us. So I, I think there's always a sort of post hoc, not rationalization, refinement, integration is probably a better way to put it. Yes. Um, that's how it feels like to me. Yes. You know, like um, we, we have these language models um, how regular are we? are we? Are we very predictable? As humans? Yeah. Um, by all the humans, yes, because we're the same system. And we, uh, I think we're 
pretty good at reading cues. We're always getting constant inputs from people. Like we're looking yeah. at each other now across yeah. the microphones. <laughs> you know, what what is the state of his mind? How is he feeling? Is he happy? All of that stuff's going in all the time. Yeah. Trying to get a machine to predict that. That's a different thing, I think. Because you think of the training course we've had all the way from like, you know, one month old lying in a nappy up to our daily professional experiences. We're yeah. constantly learning how to nuance and read people and project ourselves as well. Yes, yeah, because you can see that that two ways. Because I, I I love the um, the tradition in cognitive science that there's a, there's an ecology mm. of cognition. You know yeah. that we're socially embedded and 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 all the rest of it. But um, so you can think of that two ways. Like in in one sense, it adds constraints, mm. which does it has a regularizing pressure, which is pretty important in a society. Yes, yes. But there's but there's still potential for open ended exploration and diversity all over the place. There must be a balance between the two. You can't be completely chaotic, and you can't be completely stable, because if you're completely chaotic, I mean society would be <laughs> not a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're completely stable, then nothing really changes, and you know evolution as a society wouldn't really happen. So things like machine learning wouldn't really come out if we were completely regularized, stable intellects mm. yeah. you'd never really think of all of the kind of weird and wacky stuff that drives um, human society that's so true you know the architect of the matrix said that you know the first iterations were perfect oh yes and it was so boring <laughs> maybe that's better. what I'm clearing on <laughs> <laughs> the first one was a very good film <laughs> I know I know what happened what happened yeah. Um, but, but yeah so we exist on the kind of boundary between order and you know it's like a yin and a yang yeah 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 and then yeah. you have the sort of the learies of this world who want to kind of dope that to, yeah. to go beyond the boundaries <laughs> i'm not re- i wouldn't really suggest that yes yeah maybe a strong cup of coffee and a you know maybe a pint of beer is probably about as much as i want to dope my intellect yes yeah um so i mean i, I did a, a module in bioinformatics on my computer science degree and it was by far the most interesting and algorithmic you know learned about mm-hmm. the turby and like lots yeah. of dynamic programming algorithms yeah. and yeah. multiple sequence alignment and all this kind of stuff and i mean you're solving like really really difficult problems right mm. yeah so from a tech algorithm point of view like what are your weapons of choice oh in terms of language well, not only, I mean, just yeah, algorithms, compute architectures. I mean, how are you, how are you attacking this problem? Well, I mean, it depends. There's, there's what you just mentioned, um, sequence alignment. I yep. mean, that's just a classical statistical um, alignment process, trying mm. to get a best match between something. That's data processing. That's yep. a very different thing. I mean, so there's, there's a couple of different things we have to do. One is, I mean, if you think about it, it took... I can't remember how long it took to sequence the human genome. We can sequence one over nine and a hundred and with it, you know. Right. So that level of data flow deluge mm-hmm. is run by automated scripts doing basic stuff like aligning the, to the genome, calling interesting places. Mm-hmm. All of that kind of stuff is the meat and potatoes is what you have to do. And it's very mm-hmm. complex and you have mm-hmm. to get it right. But then trying to understand function from that is a totally different beast. And so <clears throat> one of the things I always wanted to do was to understand the encoding. And that's actually what my talk was about today. Yeah. How is function encoded in the genome? Not the genes. That I gave up when they sequenced the genome. Like That's fine. I did that off to something else. It's how are they controlled? Because yes. basically your cells are turning these things on and off in a very programmed manner. Noisy, but programmed. Yeah. And so there was stuff doing that. So what was doing that? And the fact that we find, you know, 3% of the genome codes for protein, that's, that's, that's the hard, solid bit of this. What's all the rest of it? People said it was junk, which was a very bad idea, <laughs> <laughs> because it's certainly not junk. But then how do you encode function into that? How did it evolve? And that's the problem with biology, is you're always trying to unpick a billion year long set of accidents. Yes. You know? so. Yeah. To try and do that with basic statistical processes was just not easy or even feasible. So the things I work on are called enhancers. They're literally bits of DNA in your genome and proteins called transcription factors, which are expressed in different combinations or sort of produced in different combinations and mm-hmm. different cell types and different situations, cooperate to bind to that piece. Yeah. And then they become a switch. And then that switch in a pretty unknown way can turn on a gene 
in mm-hmm. that it will make it produce more of this RNA, which is the the intermediate bit that goes on to make protein. Yes. Okay. yes. So you'll have switches to turn on hemoglobin in your red blood cells. That's why they're red. In your eye, you'll have switches to turn on crystalline, which mm-hmm. is the main you know, transparent part of your eye. So how does that happen? So what we, we knew the basic idea, and people thought it was actually quite a rare thing to have this switch. And they were known. These new methodologies that people um, developed, which were powered by this next generation sequencing boom, the fact that we can sequence millions and millions of sequences like the drop of a hat, yeah. basically means we could actually make maps of these things, and they're everywhere. And they're switching. Each cell type can almost be barcoded by its set of switches. It's unique to that, that cell type. Hmm. And so <clears throat> if if you think about it, every cell type in your body, and like I say, I don't know how many we've got, we don't know, has a different encoded language in it. Yes. So the encoding for one cell type is different to the next and different to the next. So you're not breaking one code, you're breaking multiple, if not thousands of dynamic codes simultaneously. Why is that? It's the way it's evolved. I mean, basically what the, what the yeah. genome has to do in its job is when one cell type becomes another, and you started off as one cell, yes. so by definition you have to become lots of different cells. So as it becomes different cells, it has to turn different genes on in different combinations. That's, that's how you do it. Yes, but I guess like, but in a way, I'm thinking it's a bit like geological strata, but it's not, it's much more complicated oh, no. than that. And yeah. it's massively dynamic as well. Yeah, yeah. Because they also talk to each other. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, um, th- this is really fascinating because I can see an analogy to um, to machine learning and, and even cognitive science. I mean, I, I was talking to a mechanistic interpretability engineer the other yeah. day, and they're trying to understand circuits in neural networks. And it's ridiculously complicated because you identify a circuit like an induction head and you turn it off and then the network will kind of like adapt yeah. and another circuit will take over the job of that circuit. Yeah. And then you're talking about function. Again, in, in intelligence and cognitive science, um, you have like function dynamics and behavior, mm-hmm. right? And like it's really, really divorced, like function is divorced from the underlying code in some yeah. way. I mean, it's actually pretty analogous because what you have is events, behaviors going on all of the time, but the actual final product, us and our behaviors, is yeah. such an emergent property yeah. of many, many layers. I'm right down on the very basic layer. You know, the, the actual, you know, I'm, it's where the code's being read. That's where I'm working. Yes. If you think about everything else that comes out of that, how once you've made these proteins, they go off and talk to each other, and how they fold. You have things like alpha fold, which was a massive yes. solution to that yeah. problem. Yeah. But then they have to talk to each other, and they do it dynamically, and they prefer to talk to this one more when this one's here. And then when they're together, they go and do another thing. And the complexity of that is immense. But even at my level, the complexity was so immense that there was no way. I was trying to learn the code of a tiny little bit of genome for a very long time. <clears throat> and we could never do it using stat, even the old school, old school, different non-neural network based or machine learning approaches. Just could not do it. Yes. Neural networks, basic convolutional neural network, cracked it more or less immediately. Really? Not perfectly. Yeah. But by God, I mean, you just went, wow. I mean, it was, and that's when I became born again, deep neural network, <laughs> because it's the only thing that could pick that signal out. And the important thing about it is, the human genome is huge. Yeah. So when you do one of these assays that we do, and I, I described it in my talk as etching the genome, where your DNA is all wrapped up in protein. There's about two meters of it in mm. each cell. I mean, that's a mm. huge amount of information crammed into a tiny space. But it's wrapped up in these protective um, uh, sets of proteins called nucleosomes. Mm-hmm. But they're not just protective. They're actually the access point as well. So you need to move them away to access the bit of DNA. So they yeah. that's how you, that's how those switches work. They're actually there's a structural and regulatory. And <clears throat> you can actually do an assay called uh, what is one called attack seek, one called DNA seek, it doesn't really matter. What they are is the analogous of um, etching a glass plate. Mm-hmm. So if you take a glass plate and you cover it in wax and then yeah. scrape a design on it and then put hydrofluoric acid on it, leave it for a bit and wash it all off very carefully. <laughs> it's nasty <laughs> stuff you would have an etch on it. And so yeah. these assays are actually etching free. So you isolate a cell type, 
you know, uh, like a fibroblast in your skin cells, the thing that makes your, your connective tissue. Yeah. So you isolate that in the lab and then you expose the nucleus to essentially a molecular version of that, that um, acid. Yeah. And what it will do is it will chop up the genome into little bits where it doesn't have this packing on it. Hmm. And that gives you a complete map of where all these switches are in the genome for the first time. Fascinating. And that is a perfect input for deep neural networks. Because, you, you know, you said that the convolutional neural network just got it. And in a way, are you, are you kind of like depressed that there are, there's so much structure, there's so many, so many patterns out there that we can't understand? And even when we have a language model or we have a convolutional neural network, it does it, but we don't know how. Yes, and we are always, one validation is absolutely critical to any use like this. I mean, there's, there's you know, artistic, you know, um, things are like Dali 2 or whatever. The validation is, I like the look of it, or it's a convincing photograph. Yeah. This is a science. Yes. So this has to be validated. Yes. So when you don't understand how it does it, it makes you deeply nervous. <laughs> <laughs> but you can validate it. Is it doing its job? And so it's a halfway measure we're going, if we can validate it and it's doing what we want, and we can validate it as doing what we want, it does make me nervous that we don't understand quite how it's doing it, but we are willing to use it while thinking about ways of using, I mean, what we simply do is we don't develop neural network technologies ourselves, hmm. you know, in terms of like, you know, LSTMs or whatever else. We let, because everybody's generating these things for us. We go, oh, that might work. And we yeah. take it in and we try it. Yeah. So we're looking at these more sort of interpretable sort of types of um, frameworks going as well. But there's yeah. a little bit in that it could do it beforehand, can do it now. I worry about that bit a bit later, as long as I can validate. I know it's, it's a strange world we live in because, um, <clears throat> you know, language models are getting quite reliable, but there's always that lingering doubt. And I mean, with language models, people, just, when you generate content about something you, you're not an expert in, you miss the errors. And I think interpretability on these large models is a bit of a myth. It doesn't really exist. Yeah. I mean, just take a, a, a dog classifier. Yeah. And e even on a 100 pixels squared RGB 8-bit, um, how many combinations have you got? It's, it's like, it's I ridiculous. Know, I, know. It's I mean, like you, yeah. you've got no hope in hell of ever being... I mean, what are you going to do? You're just you going to like... It's like with software. We don't understand how software works. Yeah. And especially if it's a large piece of software. So we write tests. Yeah. And it's exactly analogous, but we do it at the bench. <laughs> we write tests, but we they're experimental tests. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I can't remember who it was who said was it any technology that becomes oh, yes. officially advanced ends up looking like Indistinguishable, magic. Yeah. It's pretty much that that case. Yeah, I mean, that's where we are. Yeah. Um, but but, yeah. but but then you know, like um, Chomsky says that language models aren't a theory of linguistics, and like by the same token, I mean, as a scientist, aren't, aren't you looking for intelligible theories? <clears throat> yes, there's, there's, there's two sides of it. One is just trying to understand a basic encoding. I mean, if you think about what I'm trying to do and many other people are trying to do as well, is we're just trying to understand the basic code, yeah. you know? It's not because yeah. it, it, was, it was developed by evolution. Yes. So we have no idea how it got to be like it is. Hmm. So we're always reverse engineering to try and understand what went on there. Yeah. And so any tool at that point will help us. Because then once we can actually understand the principles, then we can start thinking about the, um, the hypotheses, the biological bigger hypotheses out of it. But there's no way you can hypothesize about the input of data. Yes. And, and you know, there's, there's the neats and the scruffies, you know, like the, the neats are searching for a simple, intelligible, parsimonious, universal underlying principle. Yep. And the scruffies are just like, oh, it's just so ridiculously complicated, you'll never understand it. Um, yeah. Well, I, that's I, a difference between physicists and biologists. <laughs> <laughs> physicists want that very, very clean, you know, equation. Yes. And me and you are basically evolutionary car crashes. Yes. You know, we happen because of many, many random encounters and pressures and you just, you know, you just, there's no way you can ever get back to a defining principle of that. Yes. We are an emergent property of three billion years of life. Yes. So it can never be reconstructed. All you can do can be deconstructed to understand how basic bits of it work. Yes, indeed. I wanted to quickly touch on, uh, I spoke with Michael Levin recently and I'm, I'm also interested in um, the work of Sebastian Risi. And so these are folks who um, talk about things like morphogenesis mm. and, and emergence. Yep. And 
in the context of AI, it's very interesting because you can potentially have these self-repairing systems, mm. you know, like yeah. if you, so you're kind of like designing the system to explicitly transgress the emergence hierarchy. Yeah. Um, you know, so you, so like the actual thing you're building is an emergent phenomenon of the underlying thing. Yeah. And I think there's loads of potential there, but I just wondered like, can, can you think of any interesting crossovers in, into AI along those lines? Uh. Not immediately, I must admit. <laughs> I'd have to have a think about it and maybe a pint of beer. Uh, I mean, I think the stuff that maybe it's just my, my kind of more applied mind, um, because some scientists are not so applied and some are. Um, I think the generative neural networks are really exciting. Yeah. You know, because yeah. if you understand the code, the gen you know, you can encode that in a generative neural network. Mm. And then can we build things which are actually useful to humans? Because I'm a medical scientist as well. I mean, that's I right. work in the Institute of Molecular Medicine. Right. So is there things there that we can actually do? Once we crack the code, mm. don't know how it got there, mm. but we can crack it. Can we use it to actually do things with yes. by, by bringing in these generative neural networks to specify bits of function in bits of DNA, which would do useful things for us? Yeah. <clears throat> so that's the one that kind of excites me a lot. Yes. Um, yes. But that's a it's a camp sound a little bit Frankensteinian, I suppose. But you know, I know. I mean, have you got any thoughts on um, regulating this technology? Do you mean AI or? Well, I mean, I, I guess that there's a there's a bit of a crossover into your neck of the woods. But you know, um, we've got this new AI Act coming into force, saying mm. that you know, like companies like OpenAI might have trouble, you know, productionizing yeah, yeah. these very open ended. Yeah. because you could use chat GPT to do anything and the open-ended nature is, is yeah. part of it because yeah. we, we always thought there was no friction between the legal landscape and technology and um, I think in, in the biology world it's far more mature than it is in the yeah. AI world I mean that, we've had those kind of concerns for a long time which is why we answered the Data Protection Act if you yeah. sequence somebody's genome you'd literally have their blueprint yes so what can you do with that? What can't you do with that? What are the ethics around that? That's been in biology for a very long time. Um, so if you understand something, so say you do some research and you find something which might have a real world sort of effect on a person, yeah. like mutation or something like that, how would you deal with that? And there's a, there's a framework in place for all of that. And that's really about um, anonymization often or consent to be informed or things like that. Yeah. Um, now you combine it with AI. Yeah, that's going to get even more interesting. I think. I know. I know. Um, you know, this nature nurture discussion has been going on forever, and you, you just said you have the blueprint if you have the yeah. DNA. And um, I guess the implication there is that you could kind of predict things about people based you know, yeah. based on the DNA. And I just wondered, do you have any? You know, you know, it's like a pendulum, and you can be one place. Mm. How how predictable is stuff from DNA? Some things like hair color and stuff is very predictable. Yeah. Um, things like disease outcomes, and this is where I think the AI comes in, because the way these disease predispositions that I work on are, is we've all got them. Hmm. You know, we have, everybody has got them. They're called common variants for a reason, because they are just very common. And the diseases are common. So having one of these signals will not predispose you, but not predispose you, so that's the wrong word, will not condemn you to a certain disease. Hmm. What it is is combinations of these signals working together in very complex ways, which we don't understand yet, yeah. which will increase your risk of a given disease. And we all have them for different diseases, it doesn't yeah. matter. Where you could imagine is that AI could, with a big enough data set, and, a big enough, and I mean sort of medical histories and the full genetics, could start to learn things like true risk. Um, mm. And I think that's an important thing we could do because you could imagine in a, a world down in the future, so your genome getting sequenced when you're born. And then actually there is your, your medical um, path could be informed by that risk. But that's a very complex thing to do in society. I mean, if you think about just the insurance alone, imagine yeah. America, yeah. if your insurance company got hold of that, I mean, what would they do with it? You know, there's a very complex interplay between these technologies and society and what's right and what's wrong. Yeah, and there's also a, a reflexive property as well, because when the information's out there, it might change. But I mean, for example, now I can get my genome sequenced and realize I'm at risk for certain things and take better, well, yeah, you know, within, you know, within better some, to some tolerances. <laughs> within some tolerances. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and also, like, there's this thing about, 
because you can't you can use statistical approaches mm. uh, but that seems a little bit brittle there's no analytical shortcut to directly indicate if someone has a certain risk potential but i guess in the future even though there's unimaginable complexity you might mm. do some kind of simulations yeah and like you do a sort of monte carlo simulation and you see like all yeah. of these trajectories and you see clusters going all over the place and then you might yeah. you might kind of like do some statistical assay of that and say well you've got all these different clusters and like most of them are in that cluster yeah. therefore you have this kind of risk yeah and it, it might you know it might um, just in the most positive way thinking about it aside from all the concerns societal concerns say you had a risk for skin cancer hmm. you know well put some block on you know don't go live in Australia you know, or if yeah. you do make sure you're actually very cautious about it because you have a, an increased risk though to be perfectly honest most of us know if we come from like uh, families where we, we know our, our kind of large scale family, we already know these risks. Yeah. Because it tends to be what your relatives die of. You know, I mean, that is the kind of the, the basic way of seeing it is if you see in a family, you know, you know, seven out of 12 adult meals died of heart attacks. Well, you know, one look at the lifestyle and two think there is a risk there. I mean, yeah. so they're not unusual con concepts for us. Yeah. I think it's formalizing, nailing them down, and then actually just making them across the full board of risk. You yes. know, glioma, skin cancer, you know, Alzheimer's, dementia, all of this stuff, you know. And what would that do to your mental health if somebody told you that at the age of like 20? I'd be like, Ugh. I know, it'd be a death sentence, wouldn't it? But then everybody would be getting it. Yes. But some people will go at the age of 20, meh, and carry on doing what they're doing. And other people are, you know, just would be worried about that yes so all of those things have to be thought about really carefully yes what else are you working on and how can people find out more about you um my website is the main place if you can face and if you're in the mood to read my reviews <laughs> and scientific papers that's where my main product comes out but obviously they're not there for easy digestion they're, they're scientific yes um, yes documents so the reviews hopefully are a bit more readable i do do public outreach um Sort of, this was a bit more public -y eye reach for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good Amazing. Morning. Professor Hughes, it's been an absolute honour. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Amazing. Thank you for a stimulating conversation. Oh, I do my very best. <laughs> 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 wonderful. Wonderful. Um, amazing. Amazing. Yeah, so the, the, the channel is Machine Learning Street Talk. Yeah, MLST. And MLST. Yeah, I followed it. Had a look. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, yeah, it's pretty cool. So it's mostly kind of yeah, computer science, machine learning, a bit of philosophy. Yeah, I, yeah. I did notice that coming through. Yes. Especially in the yeah. neuroscience side. Yeah. Well, you know what? I'm, I started out, because I've got a machine learning PhD, yeah. and it's remarkable in AI how all roads lead to philosophy. It's just ridiculous. I think um, all just humans, kind of like, don't all human thought eventually lead to philosophy? If you're doing it sensibly. Yeah, I think it, uh, that's what kind of, it's been such an education for me, mm -hmm. um, just speaking of all these amazing scientists like yourself, because it just made me realise how much stuff we don't know. That's the one take up. If anybody says we understand this, they're bloody lying. Because <laughs> it's always that next step that you're chasing. I mean, the technological arc of what we're doing over the last 50 years is bonkers. Yeah. I mean, absolutely insane. Yeah. In terms of compute power, we can edit the human genome in a human, mm. you know, and cure them of diseases that have been killing people for millennia. Yeah. You know, that kind of level of power, 50 years. I mean, it's just, I mean, you know, we went through this sort of, this whole industrialization technology, but we are literally, we're no longer exponential. I think we're pointing straight upwards. Mm. You know, it's just absolutely bonkers. Do, do, you, do you think there are, like, you know, like uh, people, like um, ex-risk people, talk about you know this kind of recursive super intelligence, recursive self-improvement, and so on. Yeah. Like there, there are always limiting factors, and like it, science is a great example. So like we're producing exponentially more papers, and we're seeing kind of like a linear yeah. improvement in science. Well, again, I think that's slightly to do with the the way science was done in the past, and the way the science is done now. Science, science is almost industrialized to some degree right you, know. um, you go back you know start of the royal society it's sort of generally rich geezers running around spending their wealth on hobbies which is fine 
But obviously there was really no chance for somebody me to do science in that area. Now it's a much more democratised thing. And I think yes. it should be. Yes. I mean, it really should be. Yeah. Um, but that just means the complexity has gone through the roof. I mean, for me to even keep up with all the papers in my own field mm. is nearly impossible. So that system is kind of broken in some ways. I mean, we need some ways of being able to digest that knowledge. And again, that is probably where these kind of language models, if properly validated and trained, actually could do something for us. Could you kind of digest the main points of a field in a reliable way mm -hmm. and guide it to give you that output by recursive you know, conversations back and forth with the whoever it is who's doing it, whatever field or whatever subject, can they do that? Does is there a real future for chat GTP beyond yeah. a very, very good liar? You know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's, not, it's, not too, it's not too bad. But is there a, a risk though? Because um, uh, we interviewed Sarah Hooker and she talked about a hardware lottery, and she was talking about how um, most AI research now is kind of like determined by previous hardware decisions that were made a long time ago. So you get these basins of attraction. Yeah. Look at all AI research now. It's basically all the same. It's sclerotic. And yeah. I should know because I, mean, I, I, I read loads of AI research. It's all language models. It's all just minor variations on the same thing. And creativity is about like something new, right? But creativity is not that common. Even no. even in yeah. even in um, you know my working life, how many times have I been creative? A few times. Yeah. I'm often generally sort of a creative person. I, mean, I actually really think I did something. You know that those are not that. Um, common and actually it's a lot of work to actually capitalize on that creativity to take it from a spark to actually something that works and is useful for whatever you were trying to do yeah so I think humans are a bit lemming like you know oh totally <laughs> but I mean partly that's because you know um, the stepping stones which lead to greatness tend to be pretty strange so there's a kind of serendipity to mm. creativity and who's going to be serendipitous when you're, you're working in academia and you want to get your PhD you want to make sure yeah. you get your papers published and you know like any job there's pressures on it and you 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 kind of have to just keep going with the system that makes sure you get paid next year you know i mean they're, yeah. they're, they're not people have this idea that you know academia we're all sitting around smoking pipes in ivory towers <laughs> gazing out the window we're not we're running around like bloody hamsters on wheels yeah. just making sure we can pay the wages and all yeah. the rest of it for our people and our research yeah. yeah so there is an awful lot of churn just to keep the job going. So then you have to squeeze your creativity into the bureaucracy, mm. um, the kind of the day-to-day -day work, the managing your students, you're doing your HR, all of that stuff. So it ends up squeezed into quite a small space. So it's not even given a lot of room in that, that job as well. And I'm sure that's the same for just about any kind of academic research. Um, I read this great book called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned by Kenneth Stanley and you know he, he says that it's all about metrics and objectives so like you know that this consensus because yeah. creating convergence instead of divergence and like you know the alternative might be that you have all these gentlemen scientists in their garages just doing <laughs> random you know but, but I, th I think there is something intrinsically powerful about creating divergent processes yeah and actually where science works best is when you have divergent people in terms of their trajectory coming yeah. from different places yeah you know you know basic things like male female ratio yeah. I mean that should be there obviously yeah. but just diversity of people because we all because of where we come from or, you know where we have even brought up, we think of things slightly differently and that's where creativity comes in you trying to explain it to somebody who's not really quite getting it mm. um, or them explaining it to you back to you better than you yeah. could explain it to them yeah. just because people see things from slightly different points of view and I think that that's a bit like what Edwin was talking about that's putting noise in the system if you have a lot of people who went to the same school or taught by the same teachers all sitting in a lab trying to do science it's nowhere near as good as having a ragtag mix of people from all over the world in a lab yeah, I completely agree. Although I would, I would go and say diversity preservation rather than diversity, because you can still have a diverse group of people. But if you still have the same monolithic objectives, there's the same consensus mechanism oh, no. that might wash away the. Di you know, it's almost like there needs to be something in the process as well as the people. No, I agree. I mean, I, and I think the problem with the way the world works in academia and, and actually just the world full stop 
is we're always trying to make they're always trying to give metrics to things to see yeah. how well you've done yeah and if you've done well enough they give you a treat which is like some more money or pay you or something like that yeah and actually that tends to make you less noisy if you want to put it in that yeah that way. it's, it's convergent.com forward slash convergent exactly yeah and so you need to be able to put some space into people's lives um, and this is actually what these things are about what we're sitting here for mm. this is where I've got a day where I don't have to worry about bureaucracy or HR or anything I have to give a talk but fine but if adrenaline is good but then you can just talk to random people and you know we've got artists and AI people and microbiologists and neurosciences all wandering around and then we're going to have a couple of drinks afterwards and I'll just make the information flow a little bit better I know but you know what because I was speaking with Piotr before and he's into theatre and no I enjoyed his talk it was great he's, he's amazing and he, he actually I think he really understands something intuitively but it's very difficult to verbalise because you know in the in this kind of western academic world we we have the you know we prime we prize abstract thinking and um what I'm saying is that washes away a lot of this subjective, creative kind of, mm. you know, flow thinking that, that artists yeah. have. And I think we're really missing a trick there. Um, yes. I mean, I, I would want to paint it so black that we're not doing it. I think it, it, it could be done better. Yeah. But if you get a couple of scientists in a room with nothing else to do, what do you think they're going to do? They're just going to be bouncing ideas around and arguing. And actually, that's the space where creativity comes in. That's, that's true. That's true. But I mean, to, to give an example, um, in, in computer science, in mazes, you have an algorithm to, to find this best solution to a yeah, maze. Yeah. And um, if it's using a, a single objective, so it might have a loss function, which is like, mm. you know, the kind of the square distance between your position and, and the end those algorithms never work very well yeah and the best algorithms are like these evolutionary algorithms where you have like a diverse set of solutions yeah. and like you yeah. know you kind of like increase the entropy and it's almost like in in the literature computer science people they've understood this for ages and it's mm. like so why do we still have these kind of like consensus mechanisms all over science i agree but then there's also the practice i'm just thinking about it from my, my average day is there is no one objective there's 20 yeah. objectives in yeah. a day and some of them are mundane and some of them are not mundane yeah like you know make sure i can convince somebody to keep my lab going for the next five years or something like that but you're also dealing with all of those objectives at the same time and they collide quite creatively you know so you're trying to think of a good project for a phd student you know who's maybe struggling a little bit or something like that go oh, actually this is a really good project and actually it has to fit a criteria like it's got to be we have to have the data it's got to be easily done it, there's no bench work involved it's all computational or vice versa mm. and then you're off trying to write you know a grant for the next five years and then you're going oh actually that is a really good idea <laughs> i came up with it for a completely different reason but it now fits in a slot that i see over here where i wanted to try and do something completely different yeah and so that that does work it's not perfect but we're not really everybody's not pointed at one thing and going go i mean yes at the high level i want us to understand how the genome works fine but there's so much bits in there and ways of looking at it and, you know that actually i do think we end up just juggling lots and lots of different balls yeah i agree with that and i, I think um if i may slightly reframe i don't know whether whether you'd agree with this but some of the objectives are written down and they're the official public facing objectives mm. and then there's all of the sub games where nothing's really written down you know like we have hidden social yeah, rules yeah. there's the social game there's like the politics game yeah, there's yeah. this game this, and, and it's almost like you are actually playing all of these different games and they kind of mix together in quite an interesting way yes um, and again that's part of the, the noise in your normal life yeah. you know so those things all push you and pull you this way and that way yeah. And that just puts, you know, you don't come in the morning going, right, I'm going to do genome today. You're yeah. getting buffeted by all of these different games, yeah. society, people, human interactions. And they kind of knock you around all over the place. And I think that is part of what creativity is. I think creativity is actually being able to positively use that. Mm. People who get frustrated by it or really want to work in a straight line really struggle to be creative in that way yes whereas if actually you've just been through a half hour beating up of a talk that you had to give or something and somebody asked you a really rotten question if you get upset by that then that's not the right way to do it 
yeah. right way to go is think, why was that such a rotten question? You know, it's so hard to answer. So if I think it's more of an attitude to some degree. And I think creative people have a much more, yeah, slightly annoying, but actually I'll just keep going. You know, I'll just think about that or I'll bring this. Yeah. So yeah. There's, a, there's a much more positive attitude to, to, to creativity, I think. I think yeah. creativity is naturally a positive thing. It requires a positive frame of mind. I completely agree. And I, I think another really cool thing about human cognition is that we can create links between seemingly very different things. And, and it's like, it's analogy making. Yeah. And it's like, there's, there's this infinite space of, of analogies. So you can have a very random experience, you know, like mm. driving to pick your kids up from school or whatever. Yeah. And you can still somehow draw on that experience if yeah. you're a creative person to influence the other things you're doing. Yeah. It's like when I was talking about the glass analogy. That was literally me watching somebody at, you know, go, making glass go, oh, it's a bit like ataxic. You yeah. know, and, but yeah. they're absolutely completely different things. Yeah. So yeah. That, that kind of sparking in between the different strands of your life, the kind of normality bits of your life, you know, is, is actually where creativity comes out. Most of my ideas, you know, any ideas I do have, I'm doing the washing up or mowing yeah. the lawn or something. I mean... But but one 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 take on this is that we're just in this kind of petri dish, and there's just all of this stuff going. I guess you can think of it in terms of free will. You know, like you could think of it as being really quite random and chaotic. Yeah. Um. Or you could think of it as saying it's quite directed, and I I have an intention, I have a will, and so on. Um. Again, I think that's a personal thing. I just um very nosy. And I get bored really easy. I mean, that, that's yeah. I do see life as structured. I'm not, you know, I'm not completely insane. I do see there is structure around me. There's a lot of random stuff that happens, obviously. Yeah. But actually, I'm just I get I get bored very easily, and I get nosy, and my brain just wanders off in those paths. So that, I think that's I, I, maybe I'm not answering or bouncing off your comment correctly, or <laughs> going off on a bloody tangent as usual. But yeah, you know, I think that's where. Um, it's the kind of nosiness. I mean, there's no, mm. uh, you know, am I trying to save humanity? No, I'm trying to increase the knowledge of humanity because I'm nosy. I mean, yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. And I think that's that's the real driver of a scientist. It's just that. And then also the good thing about that is you don't actually care what other people think about the things you're nosy about. Mm. You know, and I think that's where some of the really best sciences come from is people just wanting to understand something that nobody else gave a damn about until they went, look at this, and they went, ooh, actually, that's important. And that's adding the noise, because that's you as an individual following your own gradient of interest. Yeah. And not necessarily encumbered by other people around you. Yeah. And then you will find an interesting stepping stone. So it's almost like there's this intrepid explorer approach to science. Yeah, and the reason why you're interested in it, you may have read a science fiction book when you were 15 and loved it. Uh, you may have met somebody on the bus who was talking about their favorite hobby or mm -hmm. all of those inputs to that nosiness are also chaotic yeah as well yeah so you could never really predict why why am i suddenly interested in this stuff <laughs> it's that you know so there's a, a chaos to that as well amazing professor hughes it's been such an honor thank you so much for coming on pleasure all right <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice the problem is trying to get me to shut up at some point <laughs> no i love it that was amazing